following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In the primeval roots of all the great religions, <clears throat> one moment. In the roots of all the ancient religions, <clears throat> we always see consistent symbols. From whichever part of the world the myths arise, there are consistent elements and persistent structures. This in itself indicates to us a universal root or a great synthesis which exists outside of the perception of our immediate awareness. If we do a comparative analysis of all the great mythologies, we find the same essential stories, Symbols, structures. Gnosis itself explains the meanings in these ancient and ubiquitous symbols. To comprehend the meanings of those symbols walks hand in hand with work on oneself. Because all the ancient mythologies are merely illustrations of aspects of our own inner consciousness, our own psychology. For us to comprehend the symbolism of the great mythologies and all the beautiful stories we have in our heritage requires that we are working sincerely towards the comprehension of our own mind. It's the consciousness itself which reveals the truths hidden in those mythologies and those symbols. One of the great, always present, always visible symbols that we find in all of the ancient mythologies is the serpent. From any mythology and any religion, we always find the serpent is a core element, a core symbol. The serpent has many levels of meaning and applies to the personal, practical work that we need to perform today. So when we look at mythologies and we analyze religions and we try to comprehend the stories that they tell, 
We have to understand that these stories and mythologies are just symbols that illustrate for us fundamental psychological processes, fundamental psychological requirements and needs that the soul has in order for it to develop. We're not saying that the mythologies lack any literal truth, because often they do have literal truth. But we, we're more concerned with the practical application of mythology, the actual meaning, the intent behind the mythology. <clears throat> when we look at religion, we understand that re any religion or mystical tradition has levels. The outward appearance is the exoteric, which is a level within which the mythologies and stories are taught to the common person, the common devotee, who receives the stories and mythologies in order to develop the beginnings of comprehension, in order to start to have a parameter within which to understand the higher truths. And that devotee, with experience, with discipline, would gradually be introduced into the real meanings of those stories and mythologies. This is the esoteric level, where the real, practical, personal meaning is imparted unto that devotee. Throughout all the world religions and mythologies, the snake is the most prevalent symbol. In fact, if we look at all those ancient mythologies, there are more cults to the snake than any other animal or any other form. It's the most universal symbol. We also see it's the most ancient. In the Egyptian mythologies, the earliest symbol for the goddess was a snake. And in Egyptian mythology, Neith was the snake or serpent goddess who is the founder of the universe and the mother of the sun. We also see in Hinduism the same structure. The ancient snake goddess or snake deity wrapped around the world who in Hinduism or in Sanskrit is called anatta, which means endless one. And the symbol of anatta, or the endless one, is a serpent wrapped around the world, which in the West became known as Uruboros. And we see, if we look into last week's lecture, the Uruboros is depicted at the base of the graphic which is the serpent eating its own tail. This primeval serpent obviously contains a potent symbolism. We see in it cycles of creation and destruction, evolution and devolution, the wheel of life itself. And this wheel is synonymous with the serpent with the ancient snake. The snake is also an attribute of the goddess Kali, the goddess Durga. And here we see another aspect of this essential duality of the serpent. The serpent can be creative or destructive. This duality is critical and is expressed in all the religions and mythologies. In the Bible, we see Moses raises his serpent upon a staff and conquers the serpent of the Egyptians. So we see two serpents, one positive and one negative. Likewise, in the book of Numbers, the serpents, fiery serpents, the seraph, are sent to bite the Israelites when they're disobedient. And in order to be healed, Moses raises a serpent upon a staff, which heals them. So we see two serpents, or two aspects, two polarities. One positive, one negative. One creative, one destructive. Demeter, the Greco-Roman goddess, was also related to the serpent. 
Demeter was the earth goddess, or mother nature. She was related to crops and fertility. In the same way as that duality is expressed in the goddesses, we also see the serpent related to fertility, to the corn, to the wheat. So we see two important points about the serpent. It's dual, and it's related to the seed, to the earth, the earth mother. The serpent is also related to death. We see in the Aztec pantheon, the divine mother, Coatlicue, who's the goddess of death and wears skulls. We see Kali, or Durga, it's also related to death. So death and creation. The serpent, back in Greek mythology, is also related to Zeus. The earliest forms of Zeus, he would present himself as a serpent. And in the form of a serpent, Zeus, the father of the gods, gave birth to Dionysus. Dionysus, as you know, is the god of wine, the god of ecstasy. And it's a very controversial figure because Dionysus also is a duality. Dionysus is the god who provides ecstasy. But his ecstasy is dual. Being the child of the serpent, he reflects the duality of his father, the serpent. So the influence of Dionysus can be either positive or negative. The ecstasy of the soul, which is positive, or the ecstasies of the flesh, which are inverted, which are negative, if they're identified with. So we have these two polarities there as well. We also have the sacred python of the Greek mysteries. The great serpent who pursued Leto when she was pregnant with Zeus's children. Python was this great serpent, the child of a god as well. And when Leto escaped from Python and had her children, Apollo and Artemis, who we discussed last week. Apollo, who of course is the god of the sun, the god of light and truth, went back to kill the Python. And upon killing the Python, in the very place, he established the oracle which was his famous temple. But the priestesses of that temple were called Pythonesses. The symbolism here is, again, the duality of the serpent. The negative serpent, which has to be conquered by the hero. And upon conquering, that serpent empowers the hero. We see this also in the goddess Athena. Athena, whose symbol in her later worship was the serpent. And Athena empowers the hero to descend and conquer Medusa, who was a serpent-headed goddess. So we see positive, negative influences of the serpent. The early Israelites, in some archaeological digs in Israel, there have been found little brass serpents in the temple related to Asherat, who was a local fertility goddess. Of course, we know in the Bible that Moses creates a brass serpent. The number nine of the tarot is related, obviously, to the serpent. The character of he- in Hebrew, Tet, illustrates the serpent itself. 
It has the shape of a serpent, the form of a serpent. And the letter indicates serpent, symbolizes the serpent. The word serpent in Hebrew is nahash. And we know in the Bible that the serpent is the tempter who appears before Adam and Eve. So we see the ubiquity of the serpent in its dual nature throughout the Bible, throughout all these mythologies and religions that we've presented. But the number nine... In particular, this arcanum is pointing to the serpent for a particular reason. When we look at the previous eight arcana, we see in each letter of the Hebrew alphabet and in each card of the Torah, symbols which indicate certain processes of energy. Through all these characters, from one through eight, we see different ways that the energy of nature is modified or is processing, whether in the macrocosm or the microcosm, whether in the universe or within us. But in the number nine is how that energy is defined. From one through eight, we have the arisal, the process, and the flow of that force. The number nine is what provides the opportunity to define it. Or in other words, to polarize it. We see, of course, this letter, Tet, which has the shape of a serpent. But that same shape is in the letter nine, the number nine. But the nine, with its tail pointing down, indicates something. That tail is indicating that the hermit, the initiate, has to descend. In the same way that the heroes and gods descend in order to fulfill their mission, to fulfill their great journey to perform their duty. So when the heroes, Theseus or Perseus or Orpheus, descend into the abyss, descend into the labyrinth, they're descending in order to conquer the Minotaur, the Medusa, the serpent. So they may ascend again, but changed. This is the essential meaning of Arcanum 9. The hermit is the one who has to grasp the light, the energy we've been discussing in the Arcanas 1 through 8, and to lift that light. But in order to ascend, to lift the light, the hermit has to descend into the darkness to illuminate those regions. This is the process is called initiation. To initiate, of course, means to begin. Initiation itself is a marker of a stage of a journey. We know in our exoteric traditions, we have initiations related to passing into adulthood. And many cultures, and many traditions. And these traditions, these initiations, or symbolic events, represent the need for the soul to also pass through stages of growth. But as in any process of growth, there's pain. To descend 
in the, in the nature of the hermit, implies pain. To descend into the darkness, to descend into the abyss, is a matter of suffering. It's a matter of undergoing trials. Fighting. To achieve an initiation implies great struggle and requires that. But initiation in true, in truth, in its real aspect, has nothing to do with all the stories and tales that we hear about in all the New Age literature. It has nothing to do with physical, symbolic events. It has nothing to do with titles, honors, robes, badges, medals, certificates or the exchange of money. Initiation is a matter of the soul. To receive an initiation can only be done in one's consciousness by the being, one's own inner God. Real initiation is a process through which the soul passes inside. The Master Samael on Vior wrote that initiation is one's own life, intensely lived. But the initiation is not received by the personality. Initiation is received by the soul, by the being. This has to be very clear in our understanding. Because the ego, the tempting serpent, wants glory. The ego that we have wants to be recognized, wants to show itself. So in entering into these studies, all of us naturally want to know how we're doing. We all have the urge to understand our own place in the work, our own place in the process of the struggles that we go through. We have the urge to see where we've been and to see where we're going. The trick is the serpent, which resides within our own mind, uses that urge against us. The serpent tempts, but with that subtle voice, The serpent wants you, wants me, wants the hermit to become identified. And in regard to initiation, related to this ninth arcanum, the serpent works to say, what have you accomplished? What have you gained with your struggles, with your pain?" Are you receiving recognition? Are you receiving respect? Are others recognizing your accomplishments? So the mind becomes tempted. It's worthwhile for the student to cultivate a sense of humility, to reject this temptation and to instead cultivate the understanding that the initiate, the walker of the path, does what he does because it's his duty. That's it. Expecting no reward, expecting no recognition, and not being identified with the results of one's actions. This is the advice Krishna gives to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. Perform your duty and do not look for reward, for accomplishment. Do not look to the results of your action, meaning don't become identified. When we discuss initiation, the stages of initiation, the process of initiation, we should recall this 
And remember, the initiate, the soul who's walking the path, is doing it because it's one's duty. It's the purpose of being alive. The very point of existence. And the glory is the glory for the being. The initiations are received by the being. The honors are received by the being. The powers are received by the being. Not by the human soul. Not by the personality. So why should we, as a terrestrial person, try to take credit for the glories of God? Because of pride. Because of the serpent in its negative aspect. The stages of initiation are quite long and quite sophisticated. But the number nine figures significantly throughout all the processes of initiation. The hermit who grasps, understands, and practices the mysteries of the number nine seeks to become a perfect nine. To become a perfect nine means to achieve perfection and mastery. To become a master is one thing. To achieve the first form of mastery is a good work, but it's not a superior work. Perfection and mastery requires absolute death of the ego and beyond. But the number nine figures significantly in the process of initiation. To become the perfect nine, we have to stop being a six. A six, of course, is an inverted nine. And you'll remember from the lecture on the Arcanum Six that the number six is indecision. And that graphic depicts an initiate, a person, standing between two women, a virgin and a whore. We, as a terrestrial person, are all sixes. Three, to be exact. We are a six in our mind, in the intellect, in our thoughts, because we're, indec we're undecided. We're always battling back and forth between the opposites in our mind, between good and bad, between desire and renunciation. We're a six in our heart because we have conflicting emotions between trying to develop and, and realize the virtues of the being, such as humility and pride, between serenity and anger. We're a six in our actions, in our impulses to act, because we're always caught in that balance, that struggle between the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. So you see three sixes, which of course in the Bible represents the beast. That beast is you and me. That beast, the 666, is the nature of our own psyche tempted by the serpent, behaving in the wrong way, listening to the ego, listening to desire, listening to the personality. So to become the perfect nine is to invert those sixes in ourselves, to conquer the serpent who's within us. To conquer that serpent requires that we utilize the very force of the serpent. We have to use the serpent against itself. That serpent is dual. We see in the hand of the Divine Mother Durga a serpent. We see at the side of the Divine Mother Athena a serpent. We see in the hand of Moses a serpent. And we see in the hand of the initiate of the ninth arcanum a rod who is the serpent itself. That rod is the spinal column. 
The serpent is the fire itself, the dragon. That fire is polarized according to how we work with it. When we listen to those temptations of the serpent, to the seductions of sensation, whether the sensation is physical or emotional or mental, then we fall victim to those temptations and we begin to polarize the fires that process through us in the wrong way. The serpent, then, is the means, the power, which illuminates the lamp. We discussed in previous lectures that there are two ways to receive illumination, two ways to become Enoch, the one who sees. You can be one who sees in the light or one who sees in the darkness. This is related to how the nine works on the tree of life, which, of course, is a map of our own consciousness. When we look at the structure of the Kabbalah, we see a series of spheres. The very base of this structure, or the center in some respect, is Malkut, the tenth sphere, which symbolizes our own physical body. Above and below it are nine spheres. Nine spheres related to nine heavens, Nine spheres related to nine hells. Eighteen spheres. Initiation is the process whereby the consciousness is awakened in all of them. Positive initiation. To become a perfect nine, to have perfection in mastery, means... The master has the power to act freely in all of the spheres, all 18, symbolically speaking. These 18 spheres are symbolized by Dante in his immortal comedy. We see that Dante and Virgil descend into the inferno, which has nine levels. They have to descend to the base of the infernus, or the klipoth, the abyss, in order to ascend to heaven. This, of course, is symbolic. In the same way as all the other heroes we've discussed have to descend in order to ascend, but changed. In the center of that base, bottom, most most infernal region, Dante finds Lucifer. Master Samael on Vior states that in the center of the ninth sphere, one finds the sign of the infinite, the holy eight. What you'll notice is that that sign of the infinite is the same symbol as the Ouroboros, the serpent eating its own tail. It's a symbol of the cycle of evolution and involution, creation and destruction, birth and death. When you reflect back on what we were saying at the beginning, that all the early goddesses, Neith and Anatta, Nut, all these ancient symbols Kuatliku, of the earth goddess, the divine mother, or the Prakriti, we see that that divine mother has the form of a serpent. Zeus has the form of a serpent. And that primordial ground is the, is the process or the support, the basic function that supports all of nature, all of existence. 
So when Dante descends into the ninth sphere, he finds Lucifer, who's a symbol of the same thing. Lucifer, which in Latin means the bearer of light. Lucy, which is light, and fair, to ferry, to carry, to bear. The bearer of light. That light is the light of the Holy Eight, which is the root energy which supports all existence. The initiate, then, has to understand the symbol. The hermit walks to descend into the ninth sphere. And this has many levels of meaning. The ninth sphere, of course, is the lowest level of klipot, or hell. And this is symbolic of our own mind. The initiate has to descend inside the psyche through meditation in order to clean the stable like Hercules does to cleanse the mind of all the animal elements, to conquer the dragon, which is the mind itself, that tempting serpent. But the ninth sphere has another application. When we count from the top of the tree of life downwards, we find the ninth sphere is Yasod. Yasod is the vital energy, the etheric world. And when we apply the structure of the tree of life over the human body, we see that Yasod sits directly over the sexual organs. And we know very well that Yasod indicates the sexual energy, the sexual forces. So when we say the initiate has to descend into the ninth sphere, it's an indication that in order to rectify the earth, and find the occult stone, or the vitriol, we have to work with the powers that are hidden in the earth, our own body. Samael Anvior also stated that in the center of the earth is the sign of the infinite. This is pointing directly at the great power, root power, serpentine power, which is hidden inside the sexual waters of Yasod, which is our own sexual energy. Deep within the constitution of our very organism is the fire of the serpent, which has to be brought out. This is a matter of struggles and sufferings. That power is symbolized in this character of Tet, the Hebrew letter. We've discussed in some previous lectures about the process of the energies of the Holy Spirit flowing downwards along the tree of life. The Arcana 1 through 8 describe those different processes. But in particular, we see in 6 and 7, Six is Vav, which represents the spinal column, also related to masculine projective sexual forces. The Vav, of course, is related to our spine. But it symbolizes the descending forces that descend down this tree into the ninth sphere in us, through the human soul. We also have the number seven, which is Zayin, which looks very similar. Which is representing the ascending forces related to Neshima, the divine soul. These two are, of course, related also to Adam and Eve, or Ida and Pingala. But we see a cycle of energy here. When we unite these two aspects, male and female, we come with the character Tep, which is the serpent. 
The serpent then, the nine, holds that secret key to take those forces of the sex to conquer the serpent itself. This is the great secret of the ninth sphere. This is why in Dante's comedy, he states that Lucifer has a ladder on his back. And the ladder ascends and descends. In the same manner as the ladder that Daniel sees, or uh, Jacob sees in the Bible. There's a ladder upon which the angels are ascending and descending. That ladder is on Lucifer's back. The meaning here, Lucifer is that light or sexual power which resides in the ninth sphere, which is the power of involution and evolution, the power to ascend or descend. It's a ladder, and that ladder is the spinal column itself. And we walk that ladder according to how this energy of pep is utilized. I mentioned earlier that Apollo in the Greek pantheon was born along with a twin sister, Artemis. We know Apollo is the god of the sun. And Apollo conquers the serpent Python. But his sister, Artemis, was a virgin and chaste. So Artemis represents the feminine sexual energies of chastity. In other words, Zayin, these sexual forces that have to be brought back up for the glory of God by raising the lamp of the hermit. Apollo then is Vav, the masculine force which can conquer the serpent of Python. That serpent was threatening their mother. This is a symbol of how our own tempting, destructive serpent threatens the well-being of our own consciousness, the well-being of our own soul, the well-being of our own development. So the initiate then has to emulate those great heroes and to ascend into the ninth sphere to take the weapons provided by Athena, which is the sword and the shield. Of course, we discussed that in previous lectures, particularly number seven, how the initiate grasps the weapons in order to conquer that serpent. This all entails a process related to the word Nahash. Of course, we said that in Hebrew, the word for serpent is Nahash. But that same word also refers to two other meanings, both of which apply. You can call someone who's a diviner or a prophet Nahash. You can also say someone who's shining brass is Nahash. Now, it's curious that this word Nahash, which means serpent, also means to shine brass. Because when we look in the book of Numbers, we see the Israelites who disobey God and begin to doubt and question and to rebel. God then sends seraph. Now, this word is a little bit mysterious. And the translators of the Bible have never had an exact meaning for this word seraph. But they always put fiery serpent as the meaning. The fiery serpent, of course, that God sends, punish the Israelites who rebel. And this is a symbol of how the sexual fire causes suffering when that fire is utilized in the wrong way. 
In other words, when within us, our own egos, which really are part of us, they contain within themselves our own energy. And that energy comes from God. But when we behave in the wrong way, that energy becomes trapped in those egos. And those egos behave in the wrong way. So that's how we say the Israelites rebel. Israel is a compound word, which we've discussed many times, which points to the consciousness of the being. Israel, Isis, Ra, and El for God. But that consciousness is trapped inside of slavery, inside of the ego. And those egos misbehave, they rebel. So God sends the seraph, the fiery serpents, to punish, to make them suffer. If you ever want to know why you're suffering, this is why. Because you have inside elements which are behaving in the wrong way, or have behaved in the wrong way. So the fiery serpent, the seraph, punishes those elements. So they're suffering. And the people in the story realize we've made a mistake. And they appeal to Moses to pray on their behalf so that they can be healed. Moses does this. And God tells him, raise a fiery serpent upon a staff. And anyone who looks upon it will be healed. A serpent of brass. Nahash. Now, in alchemy, the tradition of alchemy, you have this saying, polish the brass and burn your books. Polish the brass. This is referring to Nahash, the brazen serpent. Brass, of course, is a compound metal. You make brass by combining copper and tin. And of course, copper and tin, copper is related to Venus, and tin is related to Jupiter. So you see here, feminine and masculine. But in order to do this, these metals have to be pure. If there are any impurities, that bond does not happen. The brass cannot be created. So to polish the brass means combine the masculine and feminine metals and perfect the metal that arises from that combination. This is what it means to, de to descend into the ninth sphere to work in alchemy, to polish those metals. And by this means, the brazen serpent is risen upon the staff, which is the spinal column. So God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent and raise it upon a staff, and anyone who looks upon it will be healed. The symbol here is that anyone who wants to be healed of the damage, the suffering that they've in incurred because of the fiery serpents has to work in alchemy. In other words, transmutation. To transmute is a, is a combination of parts. Trans means across. And mute, of course, or mutate means to change. To transmute is to take something and change it across to something else. And what has the power to do that but the power of the serpent, who is this power of evolution and involution, the power of change, the power to transform, the powers of creation and destruction. 
in that process, that alchemical process, the impurities have to be destroyed. That is, the egos, the desires. All of those elements which are opposed to the divine. You see, God cannot mix with pride. God cannot mix with anger. God cannot mix with lust or fear or envy. When we have those elements, God cannot go there. God is perfect. God is virtue itself. If you mix virtue with vice, what do you get? You can't do that. It's not possible. Even though we say that the energies of God are trapped in the ego, it's a root energy. It's the same, and you can understand this in the same way that you understand heat and cold. These are two energies which act as polarities, which always oppose one another. Or light and darkness. You can't have both present. If you're in a dark room and you turn on the light, the darkness is gone. Now, there can be a relative level of light. So it can be a certain level of brightness. But generally speaking, we understand that as soon as you bring heat to a cold environment, the cold is dispelled. The same is true with qualities of the mind, qualities of heart. We understand that if we have the quality of impatience and we continue to exist perpetuating this quality in ourselves, it will grow because we have feed it energy. When we feel impatient and we become identified with that impatience, all the energies that are processing through us at that time feed that impatience. So we're feeding that element, making it stronger. But if we reflect and observe ourselves and analyze that quality and make the decision that we need to become free of it, what we do is we begin to analyze how that quality is functioning in us, how that impatience is using our energy. In the same way, we begin to look at and try to discover the quality of patience, or in other words, serenity, acceptance. When we do that, and we begin to cultivate and utilize the quality of acceptance, the impatience is disempowered. Because those two cannot coexist. They may struggle. But with continued application, the patience becomes stronger and the impatience subsides. So the same is true in all the other aspects of our psyche. This is the great power of the serpent, Pet, or Nahash. That through all the processes of making ourselves from a number six, being in the middle, to being a number nine, being defined, we're doing that. We're taking that power of the serpent and utilizing it according to will. Now that is a, is a process of patience because to whiten the brass to polish the brass is not something that's accomplished overnight. It's accomplished in stages. Little by little. As a craftsman, as someone who produces a form of art, you cannot do that quickly. The great immortal works are produced with great conscious attention to every detail, 
to make them perfect. When you look at an ancient Greek sculpture or Egyptian architecture, you become astonished. Because from any point of view, all you see is perfection in those works. The same is true of the great immortal works of music, such as the symphonies of Beethoven. As a beginner, as someone who knows nothing of music, those works are impressive. But as someone who knows a lot about music, those works are immortal. The same is true of the works of the soul. The work to create the soul is to become a master. But the work to perfect the soul is to become immortal. Is to create a work of such artistic and creative genius that it defies any attempt to define it. It inspires awe. And we see this well represented in the lives of Jesus and Buddha and Krishna. Quetzalcoatl. These great masters who achieved perfection and mastery and whose every word, whose every action demonstrated a perfection and an attention to detail. As the hermit, as someone who's walking along the path, in those footsteps, we have to apply the same close attention to detail. To pay attention to the details. To not rush. Act, but slowly. With humility. With attention to detail. The process of initiation involves the number nine. And that nine, as we said, is the serpent itself, indicating the need to descend. We have in this process nine initiations of minor mysteries. These are tests, ordeals, requirements that the soul has to make to match, to prove itself. The nine initiations of minor mysteries are also called the probationary path. It's in these processes that the soul demonstrates fidelity, persistence, discipline, the willingness to do it, the ability to take it, it's not easy. It requires persistence. It requires effort. The Master Samael Anvior, in his Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, indicates that these nine minor mysteries are related to the nine spheres of the Kripal. He further indicates that it's only with the conquering of the ninth minor mystery, that one is prepared to enter the ninth sphere. This has to be understood as a symbol of the nature of initiation itself. Initiation, in all its processes, is a scale. We have these nine minor mysteries, related to those nine infernal spheres. And we have nine major mysteries related to nine superior spheres. We have 18, then. The number 18 becomes very interesting. And of course, in 10 weeks, in 9 weeks, we'll talk about that. But what's interesting is, the 18 contains the sign of the infinite. 
and the number one. The Samael and Vior indicated that to become a perfect master is to achieve perfection in all of the 18 spheres. The eight, of course, is that symbol of the infinite, which is that energy cycling in nature and cycling throughout our organism. And the one, of course, is Keter, the innermost, the father of the father. And that one is pointing, right? Pointing upwards. But when we take that number and we apply our Kabbalistic numerology, we add one and eight, it becomes nine. There you have the perfected nine. The perfected nine is that soul who has conquered the nine minor and nine major initiations and has perfected every aspect of the psyche. What's going further than that, what's also interesting, is that if you were to number all these spheres, one through nine and one through nine, you start to do a little math and you see number nine multiplied always resolves back to the number nine. Right? Nine times one, nine times two, nine times three. In each case, the resulting number is added back up to nine again. There is something significant in that. We know that Kabbalah is the science of numbers. This is no accident. This is something inherent in the structure of creation. To become that perfected nine is to have completely conquered the serpent. To conquer that serpent means to fully extract from the serpent itself all of its fire, all of its forces, and to become an absolute conqueror of the ninth sphere. The guardian of the ninth sphere, the one who tempts us through that process, is, of course, the serpent itself. We know that serpent by another name, which is Shatan. Or Satan, the tempter. Shatan, or Satan, is our own psyche. Inverted. Trapped in desire. And, in, and for us to conquer that serpent requires great works, but from moment to moment. We don't conquer the serpent in the future. It's not something that you will do one day. Someday when you have time. The serpent is active now. Shatan, or the enemy within, is working inside of each one of us right now. To conquer that serpent starts now by being attentive, by being watchful. The serpent tempts through thoughts, through feelings, through impulses, impulses to act. And the serpent's voice is subtle. In fact, in the book of Genesis, that particular word is emphasized. And the serpent was subtle. That subtlety 
occurs because we hear that voice as if it were our own. The voice of the serpent is subtle because it sounds like ourselves. This is the great difficulty. The initiate has to learn to discriminate between the voice of the serpent, or shatan, and the voice of the being, the voice of God. That discrimination comes through experience, comes through meditation. And it comes through the forces of the serpent harnessed in the right way. When we work in the ninth sphere, in the processes of transmutation, we also call transmutation sublimation. We also call it, what's the other word? No, there's another word. It's escaping me. The word means to take something coarse and make it into something more subtle. Uh, There's some. It's escaping me. But that's the basic point. We're taking something coarse or dense and making it into something refined. This isn't something that happens automatically. If we observe nature, just in general, we see that in order for something dense to become something more refined, you have to apply pressure. In nature, this happens when you leave any, any compound body within the elements of nature, and with time and pressure, that compound body will break down. In the same way with the process of coal, You apply great pressure to coal, it becomes a diamond. And really, to become a perfect nine is to become a diamond soul, Vajrasattva. But that Vajrasattva does not arise on its own. It doesn't arise as a matter of course. It doesn't come about easily. It comes about because of the application of pressure. In the ninth sphere, there's tremendous pressure. If you descend into the heart of the earth, you have all the forces of the earth compressed into that one point. And Samael and Vior indicated that in the exact center of the heart of the earth is the sign of the infinite. And the compound pressure of all of the forces, of all of the spheres, meet in exactly the center of the sign of the infinite. This is the force that the initiate has to harness. This is not easy. This means to work with the sexual energy, to withstand great pressure, tremendous forces in all the levels of the psyche, and to harness that force to take hold of it. This is well symbolized in one of the Greek myths. I'm trying to remember which one exactly. I believe it's Hercules who has to fight the river god. I'm not remembering exactly which one. And the river god is a serpent. But when he goes to fight this god of the waters it begins to change itself into all kinds of horrifying forms in order to scare him away. But he holds on, eventually conquering it. What's symbolized there is exactly the process of what happens to the initiate who tries to work in the ninth sphere. 
when you try to grab a hold of that force, it does everything it can to dissuade you, producing all kinds of appearances. This is the nature of the tempting serpent. And those appearances are very convincing. This is the subtlety of that serpent. To produce all kinds of phenomenal displays that look real, that feel real, that taste real. And we are easily fooled. We're fooled because we have pride. Because we like to feel special. We like to feel superior. We like to be recognized. We're fooled because we have envy. We feel we deserve what someone else has. We want what they have. We're fooled because we have fear. We want security. We're afraid to be poor. We're afraid to be rejected. So when we work with those forces in the ninth sphere, Shatan, the serpent we have inside, produces all kinds of appearances in the field of life. People that tell us what we're doing is crazy. People that tell us what we're doing is wrong. People that want us to be a great prophet, who want to worship us or follow us, or people who reject us absolutely. And then we feel maybe we are doing the wrong thing. The serpent shakes the mind. Shakes the processes of thought. Shakes our heart. Shakes our impulse to act. Shakes us in the sex. Shakes us in our instinct. The warrior, the initiate, has to withstand that pressure. in order to conquer the serpent. The initiate has to have the ability to receive all these impressions, all these difficulties, all of these problems, without becoming identified. The Buddha said, praise and blame, gain and loss, will come and go like a wind. To be happy, rest like a great tree, in the midst of them all. And that's the clue to move ahead in the processes of initiation. Work in the ninth sphere and develop acceptance. The Master Samael on Vior stated, let us abandon ourselves to the flow of life. This has to be understood in the right context. He's not saying we should just go along with the world. Quite the opposite. We have to fight against the current of humanity. Because humanity is following the current of devolution or flowing into the abyss to be dissolved by nature. To follow the current of our own life means to have the acceptance to receive what life brings to not fight against the ordeals and struggles that life brings. Because those ordeals and struggles are precisely what we need. Life presents us with what we deserve because of our karma, because of our past actions. The initiate who develops acceptance learns to receive all of the impressions of life without struggle, without fighting. To accept what life brings, to transform that consciously. This requires a lot of discipline. And more than that, it requires a lot of meditation. 
The only way, the only factor that we have that can give us that capacity is the being. Our own inner being. <clears throat> but he can only do that if he has the energy. We have to provide that. We have to provide the energies transmuted, transformed. So we learn how to transform our sexual forces in the ninth sphere with alchemy. We learn how to meditate. These two are the basis of the path itself to, to move ahead. Learning how to meditate, learning how to transform the energies. Right? That begins everything. But to make those energies active, to actually give them cause to produce result, there's another factor. There are many who achieve certain degrees of realization, or in other words, reach certain levels of initiation, who know very well about how to transform the energies of their body, those sacred forces, and know very well about meditation. So they're able to achieve a certain degree. But there's one piece missing. Analyzing one's own life and one's own process even though there's some temptation to look at it from the point of view of pride, we have to understand that if we are stagnant, if we feel stuck, if we feel we are working in alchemy, we are transmuting our forces, sexually speaking, we are trying to meditate, even having success in meditation, and yet, Life is stagnant. Life is dull. Then there's a, a quote that we can look to from the Master Samael on Vior. The Master Samael on Vior states One who is owed nothing is paid nothing. There are three factors. We need to transmute the sexual forces, which provides birth of the soul, birth in the ninth sphere. It also provides for death, the death of those aggregates which cause suffering. We need to meditate, which is also the same, death and birth. But we also need sacrifice. So the third aspect, the third factor. Initiations are payments that one has to earn. Initiations are payments given for assisting others. That's why I say there are plenty who know how to meditate who know how to transmute, but who achieve very little in terms of initiation because they do not sacrifice themselves for others. Now let's make an important distinction. They may perform service. They may be helpful, but not performing sacrifice. To understand sacrifice we can look to the Master Jesus who performed a tremendous sacrifice. Sacrifice is not something that can happen mechanically. It's not something that can happen 
with great comfort. Sacrifice requires giving up something. A person who donates some money to a charity or to the poor from time to time is performing a service, which is good. It's not sacrifice. But someone who gives up something for someone else. Someone who risks, who takes a chance, who extends themselves. That's sacrifice. And that is how initiations are paid. To sacrifice is to go beyond mere service. When sacrifices are performed, it's an act of giving. But it's an act of giving without any expectation of return. It's an act of giving out of compassion, out of love. Service that's performed out of a sense of duty is good. But it's not equal to sacrifice. So mere service does not earn initiations. Particularly, the higher up the scale you begin to look. The greater the degree of initiation you aspire towards, the greater degree of sacrifice is required. Think about that. The amount of sacrifice required to receive the payments of the minor initiations is quite small. But the amount of sacrifice required to receive the payments of the major initiations is quite large. Quite difficult. And the higher up the scale you look, the greater the degree of sacrifice is required. This is understandable when you grasp that to enter into the higher degrees of initiation is only possible on the straight path, the path of the bodhisattva. And in that path, one is incarnating Adam Christ within oneself. And when we look at the examples of the sacrifices performed by the great Christic masters, then we can begin to see the types of sacrifices that will be required of us. Whether they are visible or invisible, they will nonetheless be required. <clears throat> to enter into the ninth sphere is to seek to be born again. There is a law of nature that says you can only, or a law of occultism, that says you can only exit through the door you entered. The inverse is true. We were cast out of Eden through one door. That door is sexuality. We can only return to Eden through that door. In the same way, on the inverse side, the seed enters the womb and gestates for nine months till a child is formed, and then that child leaves the womb through the same door. The same is true in initiation. The initiate, the consciousness, as a seed, as an essence, enters into the ninth sphere and gestates there through the processes of the initiations. The nine minor, the nine major. And in the end, the soul is born and exits the ninth sphere. The meaning there is that to work in the ninth sphere, to work in the asad, is to work with the sexual forces in order to be born again as a soul. This is the meaning of initiation. Initiation is to develop degree by degree 
in a sense like the nine months of pregnancy until that soul is ready to be born. And when that soul is born to become second born, to be achieve the second birth, the soul leaves the ninth sphere and is born. Meaning that at a certain stage of development, the initiate abandons sexuality, abandons the sexual act. This is how the initiate, the hermit, in those stages of initiation, is recovering all the parts of the being, the nation of Israel, which is trapped, and giving those back to God, back to the being. Little by little, all those parts. We meditate on pride, we comprehend pride, we remove consciousness from pride. Humility is born. Little by little, those virtues are established once again. All the parts of the being are recovered. Then those parts of the being are perfected. But all of those forces, all of those energies are returned back to the being in the form of initiations, which the being receives. When the being receives all of that, the soul is born again as a twice born. The being is the owner of all those virtues, all those powers, all those glories, and is the owner of sex itself, which is the source of that energy. Meaning, that number nine, that hermit, cannot perform the sexual act. The initiate abandons the ninth sphere. Now, this is where some subtleties come in. Through that process of initiation, recovering all those parts of the being, The being is growing in grandeur, becoming more perfected. And when that process is complete, there is a certain degree of objective knowledge that has been acquired by the soul. But there are degrees of objective knowledge. There are levels of the being. In order for that Monad, to grow more, the monad needs more knowledge. To have more objective knowledge, to have greater degrees of objective reasoning, there has to be more experience. Meaning, the initiate, the hermit, may have to return to descend again. This is why we state that the process of initiation is scales upon scales. You can imagine a great spiral. So the initiate who achieves self-realization may yet have to go further. Now this is where we have to define between two important terms in occultism. To descend and to fall. If the being, if the monad, if the father commands it, commands his human soul to descend, that human soul will return once again and incarnate in order to gain experience, in order to gather knowledge in order to achieve greater degrees of objective reasoning. But this is under the command of the being. Some masters descend once again to incarnate and to acquire more knowledge. However, some fall. To fall is to enter again into the ninth sphere, but without the permission of the being. When that happens, the soul loses everything. The soul, the human soul, loses everything. The being remains the being. The being remains 
at the level of development that the being has. But the human soul falls. This is important to understand clearly. The being never loses his development. But the human soul, the terrestrial person, can lose everything. The one who falls loses all the development of the soul and the consciousness. The being keeps it. The human soul then has to fight to recover it. And each time, it's more difficult. Meaning that the initiate who falls, who goes against the directions of the being, revives the ego. The entire ego is re-established, is reinvigorated. So the initiate has to start over, yet with even more karma. The entire ego, all the mistakes of the past are revived with additional karma, with additional complications, with more struggle, more pain. There are many who are fallen. Many. And they have to fight in order to regain what they lost. So they have to enter again into the ninth sphere and recapitulate all of the initiations that they threw away. But with the additional karma that they acquire. Are there any questions? Um, it's also part of the uh, question of the, of the sphere of uh, Lilith and Ahama. Mm-hmm. And it says the happiness of the sphere of Lilith, Lilith do not have any hope of salvation, whereas the happiness of the sphere of Nahama still have hope of redemption. Now, we always thought that sin against the Holy Spirit is a non negotiating calm, calm mm-hmm. side, right? So, how is that possible? In the, in the book, Esoteric Course of Kabbalah, the Master Samuel Ambor says that the inhabitants of the sphere of Lilith have no hope for redemption. And the question is about karma saya and that sins against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Negotiated. Negotiated, right. Well, this has to be understood in context. No karma, let me put this another way. Karma is the law of cause and effect. When you produce a cause, there's a consequence for that. But there are degrees. The sins against the Holy Spirit are related to sins of fornication, sins of adultery, abuse of sexual forces. And when the teachings say that those sins cannot be forgiven, It means that the consequences of those actions have to be fulfilled. It doesn't mean that you're eternally damned. It means that if you produce that action, then you have to withstand the consequences of that action. But once that consequence is accomplished, the debt is paid. Do you see what I'm saying? So there is no such thing as eternal damnation. This was invented by some manipulative people in order to manipulate fear. Damnation as eternal does not fit in the context of a loving God. If there were eternal damnation, then God would be a tyrant. God is not a tyrant. Right? So, you have to understand that in context. The the, the teachings say that the door to redemption is always there. Meaning that we can always be redeemed. But 
much of the time that redemption comes at a cost, which is pain. You know, karma is not forgiven just because. Karma isn't forgiven just because we make a promise. We say, oh, I promise never to do that again. Please forgive me. Mm -mm. It's not good enough. We all make promises and we fail. Karma is forgiven when the producer of the action does not exist. Meaning that if you've committed a particular crime, let's say being jealous, and you have a problem with jealousy, and that jealousy causes you to behave in the wrong way, you've acquired karma because of that activity certain karmic consequences and pain and suffering that you'll have to sustain. If you destroy the producer of that action, which is an ego of jealousy, then that producer is no longer there. That action cannot occur. So the residue, the karmic results that you still owe, can be forgiven. And they can be forgiven by your divine mother or by the courts of the law. And that applies in general to many of the processes of the ego. But when it comes to crimes of sexuality, those crimes have to be paid for by facing the consequences of those crimes. Those crimes cannot be erased. Even if you destroy the ego of lust that produced the action, you still have to pay the consequences of the action. What he's saying there is exactly what I'm trying to explain in longer terms, which is that the salvation from those types of activities occurs when the debts are paid. That means there's no hope to escape the debt. Right? So maybe it's a subtlety in the translation. You can't be saved from those debts. That's all. Yes? Okay, again, we have to define the difference between descend and fall. The question is, how does the human soul descend, right? The question is, how does the human soul descend? How exactly does one descend to gain more knowledge? To gain more knowledge. Does this mean the human soul develops the ego again? Okay. In a descent, the human soul descends in order to gain knowledge. This does not mean the ego is revived. Now, there will be work to be done which apply to the level of being of that particular initiate. You have to understand that even when the ego is dead, there's work to do. The, e the end of the ego is not the end of the work. In some respects, you can say the end of the ego is the beginning of the work. In some ways, you can say that. So if a human soul descends, meaning they do not fall, they enter again into incarnation in order to develop more qualities of the being, which is a different form of work than what we're doing. Because <laughs> we have the ego alive. Any other questions? The question is, if we fall, how is the ego reborn? Doesn't the ego die permanently when it's killed? The answer is related to the atomic strata that form our psyche. The ego is, in a sense, this is one of the great mysteries in occultism. The reviving of the ego occurs because of karma. And it occurs because the soul... It's hard to put that in simple terms. 
Yeah, I mean, the energy is transformed in the wrong way, and the, the reviving of the ego has to do with the way nature recapit recapitulates things. There are certain laws in nature that determine how things arise and fall. When you return once again to the wrong action and you fall, nature automatically revives the, the latent seeds or the latent forces which reside in the depths of the psyche. It's kind of difficult to explain more simply than that for me. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Yeah. Number 999? Yeah. Right. Yeah, where, where is that number 999 coming from? I don't know. Okay, let me ask you one more then. Mm. Um, more on this 999. In Initiatic Path of Karen Kabbalah, somehow mentions the Kabbalah and year of birth, inner urgency, and the fundamental tendency. What would it mean if these were all nine? The question is about fundamental tendency, the inner urge, and the keynote, which the Master Samael describes in Torah and Kabbalah. And what if all of these resolve to the number nine? That means you need to work in the ninth sphere. You need to be the hermit. Simple. Those, those uh, numbers present subtle, subtle meanings that your soul has to comprehend. Your intellect will struggle. So you have to meditate. You have to meditate on the numbers that are resolved from that type of mathematics. Another question? Well, the sacrifice, um, would that sacrifice ever be, say, to help someone else? You would sacrifice some of your own spiritual practice. In what way? Well, let's say time. Sure. Sacrifice requires that you're giving up something. It's, yeah, and you can be presented temptations that appear to be sacrificial. Like, you may be tempted to do something that you would think would be a sacrifice, but actually be the wrong thing. That's the difficulty. Many initiates fall into that trap, thinking they're performing sacrifice for others, for example, by teaching, let's say, which is good. We need people to teach. But the serpent can tempt the instructor exactly in that place, in the, in the area of teaching, through pride, through lust, through envy. So what seems on the surface to be a good act of sacrifice can actually become wrong because the initiate is falling under the hypnotism of that serpent. Does that make sense? Any other question? You said the, uh, the voice of like ego... Yeah. The voice of the, the being must be even exponentially more subtle. So I guess it's not necessarily a question of this, I'm just saying it, but like the power of the ego is, is how subtle it is. You don't even understand or don't even realize what it actually is that's being spoken. Right. Affected by. The question is how do we discriminate between the subtle voice of the serpent and the subtle voice of the being? And that comes with experience. It starts with knowledge. To comprehend the being, you have to learn to speak the language of the being. If the being, if your own inner God is trying to communicate to you, you have to understand that language first. That language is Kabbalah. That's why we study Kabbalah. But the capacity to hear that, to have the Kabel, to receive that, comes through the other tree, which is Da'at, alchemy. So the energy that we transmute fuels our capacity to hear the voice of the being. And we channel that force and energy through meditation. We learn to express that willpower and the receptive qualities, you know, masculine and feminine, in order to receive that voice, to hear that voice. So knowledge is the first part. To study the Kabbalah, 
to study those two trees, Kabbalah and alchemy, and to understand them in light of our own experience. Point being. It's a long process. And to comprehend the being is, the, is self-realization itself. Right? So along the way, along the stages of initiation, we're gathering and gaining degree by degree more and more understanding of how the being communicates and how the serpent tempts us. Those two are hand in hand. What happens is this. When you're meditating on an ego, you're meditating on yourself. The, the process is to analyze one's own behavior. And to do that, you have to understand what is right and what is wrong. But the sense of knowing that doesn't come from any book. It doesn't come from any moral code. We have some guidance. I mean, we have the Ten Commandments and we have the precepts. We have different kinds of rules that give us a general idea. And that's a form of knowledge. But to really know right from wrong is a matter of knowing with the consciousness, knowing with the heart, knowing through intuition. And again, that comes from transmutation and meditation. Those two qualities develop in, uh, intuition in us. And I'm putting it to you in that way because to know what's right and to know what's wrong is individual. It's to know according to your own being and according to your own station in that moment. An action that's right for me at this point in my life would be wrong for you. And vice versa. As you, as you analyze yourself and you look at the ego and you observe a particular event, you're analyzing it to see what were the elements that were influencing my psyche in that moment. Yes, the point is to find out where we were identified. True. We have to discover that in the three brains. So if we had a conflict with someone and we became irritated, we have to meditate. Why did I become irritated with this person? But more than that, we have to also see, did I know better? Was something telling me the right thing to do and I ignored it? Did I have a feeling that I ignored, which would have been the voice of the being, potentially? So we have to analyze both sides. What did I do wrong? And then we have to say, what should I have done? What would have been the right behavior? It's from this analysis, this kind of analysis, in meditation, that you can start to, to learn to distinguish between the tastes, individually, in terms of what is right and wrong. And again, it will change from situation to situation and moment to moment according to the nature of your own situation and your own idiosyncrasy. This is subtle art. Is a question? Okay, the question is, what does Vajrasattva mean? How long of an answer do you want? Short version, hmm. Well, the short version is, it means diamond soul. But it means a lot more than that, if you break it down. Uh, in another lecture, we're going to talk about Vajra and what that means. This is a term that has a lot of significance. Sattva means essence of or embodiment of. So a Vajrasattva is the essence of Vajra. Uh, superficially, Vajra can mean diamond, so essence of the diamond. It can also mean thunderbolt, so essence of thunder. So this is referring to the being, Zeus, 
the god of thunder and lightning. Another question? Thor, Thor too, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to study that. <laughs> yeah, I think any additional questions we can post in the forum. There's an area for this course. So thank you all. We'll see you next week. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.